Welcome, friends. My name is Gary James. I'm pastor here at Valley View Alliance Church in Newmarket, just north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I did not have the privilege of knowing Emily. Outside of maybe I met her at a Christmas Eve service with her mom a few years ago. Uh, they may have been at. Uh, but that would be the only, the only time that I would have possibly met her. But I'm glad that you're with us today, Peggy and Paul and all of the family and just a couple of friends. And I want to just say thank you to those who are joining us online from various places. 
near and far. Friends, I always remind myself and all who gather for memorial services that for generations, people have a history of looking to God and finding strength in him for our lives in times like this. And the first place we generally look is to the scriptures. So I'd like to just take a moment and read us a few verses selected uh, throughout the scriptures and just invite you to listen and allow them to percolate down in and bring comfort to your weary soul this morning. Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. And then finally, Jesus' words to his disciples. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Oh God, you are the giver and the sustainer of all that has life. You are the one whose thoughts designed our existence, whose purposes were seen in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And it is you, Lord, who awakens in us capacity to positively respond to the truth of your word and to your love as you draw us to yourself. So we come to you this morning. We come with all the pain of our loss. We come with both our hopes and dreams and our shattered hopes and dreams. We come with our fears for the days ahead. And we confess to you today that deep within us, there is yet a sense of incompleteness. Within us, we have aspirations that can never be filled and satisfied in this world. And the passing of Emily has reminded us once again of our need for you to comfort us, to nurture us as we walk through this life. Lord, would you help us in this time this morning, in the midst of death, and as we think about the future, help us to see our opportunities for life's fulfillment and completed purposes in and through Jesus Christ, your Son. And Lord, in times like this, sometimes with the weight of our loss, we're not sure how to pray. So we turn to you and we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we were all shocked last week to hear of Emily's passing. She will indeed be missed by family and friends, and I understand some fellow students in Thunder Bay, as well as family around the world. Today we're here to remember Emily. We're here to grieve her loss to each of us. So can I make an invitation to you who are here with us and those who are watching online? Feel free. Feel free to smile and laugh at funny photos or funny stories. And feel free to cry and weep when moments get tender. Your freedom, grieve the way that's best for you as we 
remember Emily's life. We're going to have several tributes this morning. First, we'll have a spoken tribute from each of two of Emily's aunts. First, we'll hear from Aunt Ingrid Rutenbeek, who will come and, uh, Rutenbeek Black, sorry, and uh, then we'll hear from Aunt Kathy McCon. And then we'll hear a musical tribute with photos. The photos were compiled by Emily's mom, Peggy, this week, and the music behind them, the hallelujah, was recorded by Emily's cousin, Andrew Beauchamp. So I'm going to invite Ingrid to come at this time. Good morning. I would like to start by reading a message from my mom and my brother Bruce, who couldn't be with us here today. Once I get my glasses. It is not real to believe Emily, M, to us, will not be coming to the cottage anymore. From the time she was only a few months old, on the deck in her playpen, overlooking Georgian Bay, up until last summer stopping by for a few days as she drove to Thunder Bay for school. The cottage was a place for family and friends for Emily, a place of adventure, hot summer days and cold winter nights, where she learned to tube, canoe, paddleboard and water ski, fishing and enjoying bonfires and fireworks, and where she learned to snowmobile, a place where her passion for Northern Ontario was awakened. Emily was a character, always in a good mood and looking after her little brother, Carter. How we miss her, gone so suddenly, it is too hard to believe she was far too young. On behalf of Emily's father, Paul, I would like to say a few words. As I struggled to write this, to find the words, I realized that I shouldn't be required to write my thoughts and memories of my daughter who was just 21 years old. She was just about to begin the next chapter of her life when she was taken from us. From the time that she was a cute baby with very blonde hair that naturally spiked up, Emily was ready to be adventurous and live life. She was more than just caring and kind and active in what she did, sports, music, academics. She was passionate about it all. Emily did them all with excellence. She was a high achiever. Her most passionate vice was hockey, something we so much enjoyed together. As you have heard, she played hockey aggressively, loved to watch it on TV, and always looked forward to our yearly outings, along with Carter, to a Leaf game and meeting players. Emily loved the outdoors, as many knew, which I attribute to the cottage and I thank my mother and father who were able to provide it to her. Spring, summer, fall and winter, it didn't matter the season, she wanted to go as there was always something exciting and new things to do. 
Carter's fondest memories of his sister are of the two of them on the tube, them versus dad. They learned to work together to make it nearly impossible for Paul to dump them. It required crazy speeds and turns to flip them, and even though he was sometimes scared they would be hurt, they were only laughing when he went to pick them up. Snowmobiling provided the same thrill for Emily. Out for an eight-hour ride, enjoying the beauty of the country in winter and speeding across the lake at 70 miles an hour. I could always rely on Emily, especially when it came to health care. She was a natural caregiver, and her planned career as a nurse was definitely perfectly perfect for her. She would be calm when Carter or I would get injured, which occurred often, and got to work tending to the injury and keeping us calm at the same time. She was an amazing human being, and we were lucky to have had her look after us. I feel grateful to have had our drives to and from Thunder Bay with hours to talk. I am thankful to have had Emily living with me for the past three months. Our continual talks of what was next for her, her future plans of being a nurse in Northern Ontario, of wanting to do a snowmobiling trip together, and of her love for her new kitten, Apollo. Emily, I miss you. I love you. It is unfair that you have been taken from us. I will think of you all the time. I know I am a better person for having had the privilege to be your father. Thank you. Today, we've gathered in person and virtually, friends and family, literally from around the world, not only to mourn the loss of Emily, but more importantly, to celebrate her life. Good morning. Peggy and Paul have asked me to say a few words reflecting on Emily's life by sharing memories from her family and friends. I'm going to start with one of my own memories. Emily visited my home often as a toddler and young child before she started playing hockey on weekends. She and I would be up early and let her mother have a bit of a sleep in. Emily quickly learned though that Auntie Kathy doesn't play until she's had her second cup of tea. She would sit beside me at the dining room table and she would ask hopefully, is that your second cup Auntie Kathy? A little later, there would be a big sigh, and I would hear, are you done yet? From Emily's cousin, Sarah Huggins. When thinking of happy memories of Emily, it was hard to choose which to go into detail about. From playing multiple rounds of hide and seek in the dark at family gatherings, sleeping all together in the TV room after my dad read us scary stories, to running around the front lawn in the snow after going in the hot tub, and many more. It was hard to choose just one. The memories that stick out the most to me, though, are from camping. Aunt Peggy would borrow my parents' trailer and take me, Emily, and Carter camping for a week in the summer. Somehow, she always managed to choose the hottest week in the summer every single year. One year in particular was so hot that we were all so exhausted and grumpy in the afternoon, biting each other's heads off. The walk to the beach, our only relief from the heat, was across sand dunes through what we called the Devil's Punch Bowl. 
It was this section where we had to walk down a big hill of hot sand and then up another with the heat magnifying around us. We had to hike across the sand dunes under the beating sun, carrying all of the beach gear, grumpy and snapping at each other the whole way. I know this doesn't sound like a happy memory so far, but when we eventually made it to the beach and dumped all our stuff, Carter, Emily and I immediately ran into the water and our bad moods were completely lifted as we cooled down and we proceeded to have so much fun playing in the water and in the sand. Eventually we would head back and have dinner and then spend the night playing games and roasting marshmallows, arguing over who got to build the fire that night, but most importantly, laughing and having fun. I will forever treasure those camping trips and the memories I have from them. From Emily's cousin, Bronwyn Fitzsimmons. It's a small memory, but here goes. One of the things I remember most vividly about living with Emily, Peggy, and Carter was how much Emily loved their cat, Smokey. She would put the cat in a harness and take her out in the backyard on warm, sunny days. Emily would laugh at all the silly things Smokey did as she explored the grass and the dirt for the first time. Emily always seemed happiest when she was around animals. Emily's friend Morgan Clark shared this memory. A number of years ago, Peggy charged Emily and me to make lunch for ourselves and for Carter. Little did she know just what she'd asked of us. Naturally, we decided that we would make a box of Kraft dinner. After the noodles had been cooking for a while, we decided it was time to test them. Emily informed me that the best way to test a noodle is to throw it up on the ceiling. If it sticks, then it's done. Don't ask me how we were planning on getting the noodles off the ceiling. So we chucked up the first noodle. It landed in the light fixture. Peggy, there's a distinct possibility it's still there. The second noodle came crashing back down at us. Finally, the third noodle stuck. It was ready. Then came the cheese. Now everybody knows that you drain the water before dumping in the cheese powder. We missed that part. After draining the water, we were left with wet noodles with a hint of cheese. To salvage lunch, Emily took out a block of real cheese from the fridge and started loading it into the pan. I don't remember whether or not our creation was actually tasted good, but this day was one for the books. From Emily's cousin, Katie Rutenbeek. I can't even possibly imagine how to express my words of someone I love in just a few sentences. Emily was one of the most beautiful, kind, and forgiving people I have ever met. She carried a radiance that was contagious in any room she walked in. I remember many nights watching movies with Em, usually Disney movies, reading her stories before bed, always more than one, talking about gymnastics, playing outside, and oh boy, the times at the cottage. I think my Uncle Paul had as much fun dumping us in the lake when we were tubing as we did. Just over three years ago, I got the privilege of Emily meeting my son. It was something I had never thought about, but watching my cousin, who was always like a little sister to me, hold my baby boy in her arms was one of the most beautiful things I could ever feel. I don't know how to express my love and hurt right now. But anyone who knew Emily would understand. Rest well, beautiful girl. Make sure you give Opa a run for his money in cribbage. I love you. Katie. Emily's cousins, Rebecca and Jessica Williamson, sent us this memory. Although we only got to see Emily once or twice a year due to living in the States, Jessica and I always have so much fun at the annual family Christmas party. All of the younger cousins would play endless games of hide and seek in Aunt Marlene and Uncle Richard's basement, with the hiding places being more obscure and challenging every time. We would all play rounds and rounds of marbles, alternating partners, and laughing as we would all backwards for each other into oblivion. Two years ago, at Christmas, 
we were all sleeping in the basement, and M hadn't woken up to her alarm yet. So Uncle Richard came down, blasting music to get her up. She was so mad, but Uncle Richard was, of course, gleefully dancing around her bed until she finally got up. Jess was too little to remember this, but I have a picture of me, Sarah, Emily, and Carter, all on the edge of the Maid of the Mist boat in Niagara Falls. We were all pretty young, so I don't remember a lot of the details, but I do remember getting absolutely soaked with my cousins and laughing at our moms who hated being wet. I look at that picture often. From Grandma Beauchamp. Emily was born the year before I retired, and then a few months later, Ted and I moved to our new home just north of Hamilton. My early memories of Emily as a toddler and preschooler sent her there, and these memories have come back strongly in these past few days. It felt to me that I was almost one of her toys. We played so well together. There was running, skipping, and jumping as we made our way down the walkway to the clubhouse and back again. There was playing with balls, throwing and running after them, since neither of us was very good at catching. Lots of laughter to accompany it all. Then she would roll around on the grass amid more laughter. And then there was Grandpa's big green chair in the living room. It was so good for story reading and pretending. But the enjoyment improved whenever Cousin Sarah was in the chair with her. These memories are but a sample and they will be with me forever. From Emily's Aunt Ruth and Uncle Mike Beauchamp. One of Mike's fond memories of Emily was the day we drove up to Newmarket in the pouring rain to help Emily pick out her first electric guitar from Cosmos Music. Ask Peggy which birthday it was, we don't remember. She tried out a few different guitars and settled on a black Stratocaster, very similar to her cousin Joel's guitar. It was a good Uncle Mike moment to be connected with Emily through music. We also have many fond memories of anchoring our boat near the cottage and spending time on the water with Emily and Carter, as well as cliff jumping at Kilbear Provincial Park, and many days spent at the beach at Kilcorsey Bay. Another from a dear friend who shared his memories with Emily's father, Paul. I totally remember a girl who painted her nails on the dock and also wanted to participate in water gun fights. She was into every ride possible at Wonderland. But when you talked about her, your, her personality was more illuminated. She was a risk taker, liked to do things her way, stubborn, which I clearly feel is genetic. Emily may have had some hard times throughout her life, but she had the strength to persevere. From Emily's cousin, Danielle Huggins. There are many happy memories, so many camping trips and Christmas carols that always will be special. I remember our camping trip to Kilbear, watching Emily jump without fear from the rocks into the water. And it was okay because Uncle Richard said we could jump from any rock we want. Emily was fearless. If there was an adventure to be had, she would take it. I got to be a small part of one of her big adventures, choosing the right school. When I was in teacher's college, Emily came to visit me in Thunder Bay to tour Lakehead. We spent the weekend visiting the campus, seeing where she would do her labs and lectures. I took her to all the places that had become special to me there and saw as they began to become special to her. I think she always knew that it was the school for her. Small town feel, big town hospital. But most importantly, hockey culture is huge. We visited arenas, went to see where the teams trained, and talked to people about skating on the lake. Of course, it was boring for me because I don't think I've ever watched a full hockey game. But for Emily, that was make or break. She loved the idea of leaving her dorm room to skate right outside it. 
As we toured and ate our Persian donuts, I was struck by how she knew exactly what she wanted, like she could already see the person she was going to become. Even my warnings about the stabby and non-stabby parts of town couldn't change her mind. She knew her path, and she was ready to start. Jumping off cliffs, moving so far, it didn't matter. She was fearless. A broken bone heals. She knew that well. And time heals. She also knew that. The distance didn't matter because she knew where home was. She could jump because she knew and she would always find her way home. From Emily's good friend, Allie Kleinstuber, trying to write this has been one of the hardest things in my entire life. Trying to think of one specific memory is hard as there are so many to choose from. Most of our memories are from hockey as it was a huge part of our friendship. For years, we would go away to tournaments, stay up all night eating junk food at, and at Deerhurst, we loved hiding in the bookshelves with the team. Emily was always the life of the party, cracking jokes or putting Cheetos in her mouth so she could look like a walrus. In our last year of hockey, we were on the blue team. During our last away tournament, Emily's parents weren't able to come, so she came with my mom and me. Emily and I were the only kids on the team who didn't have a parent in the hotel room as my mom was in a different room. Our room became the designated hangout room and thus 13 girls all piled into one bed watching border security for three hours straight because Emily swore that we would all enjoy it. And we did. It was one of the best bonding tournaments and experiences in my life, all because of her. Emily was always trying to get the team to bond and hang out together because that's just who she was. Always trying to make sure we were a team. I have so many memories and I will cherish each and every one of them for the rest of time. I will love her always. From Emily's Uncle Richards. I wish that I could tell you all a single anecdote about Emily, something that was unique to her and me. But as it turns out, my memories of Em all come from groups, from family settings, and perhaps that's not too bad. Three scenes quickly jumped to mind when I started to compose this. The first was cliff jumping at Kilbear Provincial Park. I had volunteered to take a gaggle of children to the waterside rocks and supervise their fun. Emily and the rest were having one of those idyllic Norman Rockwell days. Hot summer, vacation in a park, lots of family, the excitement of leaping into the void, flying through the air, then the shock of the cold water. Something that struck me was that when we first arrived, Emily immediately asked me how high they could jump from, which point was the limit. Thereafter, Emily spent time enjoying herself, but she also spent a lot of time with her brother, working with him, cajoling him, encouraging him to jump from the same heights as she did. That sisterly attention struck me at the time and stays with me now. Another early time was when Emily Carter and Peggy joined us for Thanksgiving camping at Point Farms Provincial Park. We all decorated the campsites and the kids were very involved. Black and orange lights, spider webbing on the trees, gowls and goblins. We even won one of the prizes. The kids had costumes and I was to be the supervising adult. When the kids went trick-or-treating around the camp, so I had a costume. It was a clown, of course. What I remember was the bright light delight of the three cousins as they did Halloween at camp. The third memory was a Christmas gathering at my house. The adults were all on the main floor. For the cousins, though, it was sleepover time, and they were all tucked in downstairs in the basement. Time for stories and settle them for the night. Uncle Richard was up to the task. Now let's be honest, no book was going to settle those cousins to sleep. They were going to be awake all night talking and giggling late into the night, no matter what I read. I slipped downstairs quickly to avoid getting caught. Then I read to them, scary stories to read in the dark. A lovely collection of horror stories with art, age appropriate, of course. When I went back upstairs, I got caught. Some, or maybe all, of the mums questioned my story choice. 
But for the cousins, this scary sleep overnight became a wonderful memory that they talked about for a long time after. Emily was a leader and a shining light. Her light has not gone, but it has moved on. Moved on far too early. And I'm heartsick. Sorry. Grant Ronsevich developed a very close friendship with Emily in Australia, and they've stayed in touch many times, having uh, video chats frequently. Grant sent us this. How hard it is to put a friendship into words. You simply cannot quantify or condense it into a simple paragraph. As I write this, all the conversations we have had over the years slowly come back to me. All the secrets we have shared and how we both worked through each other's problems or tried to cheer up one another when we were feeling down. You were only a recent addition to my life, but one so unique that I cherished it, and almost everyone in my life knows about my Canadian friend. You were truly one of a kind, and my world is forever going to be missing a piece without you in it. I will miss you immensely, little possum. Love you, Grant. I'm almost done. Next is a submission from Emily's Aunt Terry in Australia, who shared her memories in the form of a letter to Emily. I'm going to apologize now and become, in case I become a bit emotional as I read it. Emily, you came into our family for a short time. It was such an adventure for you to travel halfway around the world by yourself. I could not have done it at the young age of 18, but you had all the confidence in the world. You studied and passed your Australian lifeguard course in an effort to find work. And we pounded the pavement together, handing out your resume to cafe and retail shops. But you ultimately found a good job on your own. I remember when you phoned me at work with the news. I got a job, Aunt Terry. They will train me and pay me $25 an hour. I can start tomorrow. I congratulated you and asked what the job entails. You calmly said, I'll be cleaning and testing dirt. And so began your working life in Australia. You were proud to wear your steel cap boots and put on your high visibility shirt and pants and head out the door to work. At home, you then had to adjust to life in Aunt Terry's house. No, Emily, off the couch, you're covered in dirt. Hit the shower before dinner. You gave me your cheeky grin and headed down the hall. I told you that you would get the same treatment as my own kids. I love you all. You found a social life here too that involved your passion for hockey. Weekends were spent going to roller hockey and ice hockey games. And then you broke your leg. This could have ended both your job and your social life, but we found your peg leg. You continued with your job and went to watch as many games of roller hockey that you could. Aaron's boys, Jeffrey and Matthew, loved playing games with you and you introduced them to hockey. You helped measure them up for sticks and showed them how to play the game. You even came with me on my girls' weekend of crafting. You had just broken your leg and I didn't want to miss out with my girlfriend, so I dragged you along. Again, your cheeky grin won everyone over. You surprised yourself at some skills you acquired with a needle and thread. Matthew had a favorite stuffed toy in Grandma's mending pile that he was proud to tell everyone Emily fixed it. You enjoyed doing the needlepoint enough that you asked me to take home the little project with the Canadian geese to finish for your room at university. You left me with many memories of your time immersed in our family. I miss you and love you, Emily. Love, Aunt Terry. I'll be ending with another letter to Emily this time from her mother, Peggy. Emily, I cried happy tears the day you were born. I cry sad tears now as my heart is broken. And my heart also breaks for Carter, who has lost his sister. I've prepared many slideshows over the years, but none have been this difficult. 
How could I choose what to include? Every photo is a wonderful memory, and I am grateful that I have so many. As I poured through the thousands of photos, I was riding an emotional roller coaster, and the most powerful emotion I felt was love. Emily, you were loved. I feel your presence everywhere. This week, I found myself looking at some of your old children's books, and as sad as I am, I was able to smile as a flood of happy memories hit me from when you sat on my lap for three stories before bed. When we finished the second story, you would say, time for the one more book. I could almost hear your little voice in my head as you got excited as we read your favorite Sesame Street book. You knocked on the page as if it were Oscar's trash can lid and shouted, Oscar, are you in there? Photos and everyday items in the house are bringing back more memories. I am reminded of your smiling face and the feel of our arms holding each other as they were in the photos. The cooler bags we packed for our road trips, full of snacks, reminding me of our drive to Pennsylvania. And of course, you had to drive. And how we laughed hysterically as we got lost on the dangerous bumpy dirt road near Aunt Laura's house. Thanks, Garmin. And how we chatted and listened to the music in the car with Aunt Terry on the way home. And of course, you had to drive. My Bob Ross painting reminds us of our fun painting pub night that we had every time I walk down the stairs and see it hanging. And as I walk into the laundry room, I see the happy photos of our New York trip and the camping trips where we were drenched in sweat, smiling and laughing. Emily, this slideshow is a tribute to you. And I can only hope it provides comfort to all of your family and friends as it did for me. Emily, you made me proud. You were loved. You will be missed. Don't worry. I'll remember to get Smokey to give me high fives for treats, just like you taught her. And the little ugly statue sits proudly on Grandma's shelf and thanks you for the trip to Australia. Love, Mom.
remember when I moved in you And the holy dove was moving too And every breath we drew is hallelujah 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 Hallelujah.
Wow. Ingrid, way to go. Kathy, way to go. Mom, what a slideshow. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you all for those wonderful memories. I want to share uh, with you just briefly before we conclude our time. A scripture that I spoke with Peggy and Kathy and Wendy about on Monday. And the truth is the message that's in this scripture verse is not just for them or just for you. It's for me as well. And I think for those who are joining us online as well. From the prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 17, one verse says this, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I want to unpack that just very briefly for us this morning. And as we do, I trust that these promises can bring encouragement and hope and courage for each of you who are so missing Emily in these days. The first promise is simple, says the Lord your God is with you. And I'd like to paint a picture of what that means for us. When I was young, uh, a young guy, my parents would take us to the Canadian National Exhibition, the CNE in Toronto. And I remember the crowds. Uh, I loved the food building. And I always loved it if we got to go from the food building to a crazy ride and back to the food building, because that would really upset my brother's stomach. We had some great times there. But as we traveled around the grounds of the CNE, the crowds frankly scared me. And I can remember even as a young boy thinking to myself, I can't see where we're going next. I can't see over the crowd, but if I could just Hang on to my dad's hand. He can see over the crowd and he knows where we're going next. So if I can just hang on to dad, it'll be okay. And I think that's precisely what God from heaven is saying to us in this scripture verse. The Lord your God is with you. In the midst of our grief, in the midst of our fears, in the midst of the confusion Brain fog, I think, Peggy, you called it brain fog earlier in the week. Yeah, it's grief fog. It is. And I think God's saying, it's okay. I'll be with you. When the prophet first wrote these words to God's people, they were away from home. They had been captured, taken as prisoners, taken to another land, forced into slavery. They had nothing for sure. They didn't know what tomorrow would hold. Everything in their life was upside down all of a sudden. And you know, that's very similar to some of the emotions we feel when we lose someone we love. And in the midst of our pain and our confusion and our fears, I believe God wants you and I both to know that the Lord your God is with you. Even as parent look to, uh, children look to their parents to help them get through a crowd so we can look to God and have the assurance that our Father in heaven has us in his grip and won't let go. Then he says, the second promise, he's mighty to save. There's a great, a, a great illustration, that a picture that comes to mind about what this means. A, a young child and their father were out driving in the country road, beautiful spring afternoon, and a bumblebee flew in the window. The child who was allergic to bee stings became frantic. The father quickly reached across the dashboard and crumpled his hand around the bee and squeezed it gently. The child grew calm. And then a few moments later, the father released his hand and the bee began to fly again. The child went frantic again, but the father just simply held out his hand and said, it's okay. See my palm? I took the sting for you. 
The child relaxed, knowing that bees can only sting once. Knew that his father had taken the sting on, on their behalf. I think that's what the Father in heaven says to us. He says, look, the sting of death is awful. But I sent my son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sins so that the sting of death could be taken away on our behalf. You don't need to sting. Fear the sting of the bee. You don't need to fear anymore the sting of death. Christ has come. We'll celebrate that this week. Christ died and Christ rose again. And by this, he has taken the sting of death for us. The Bible tells us clearly that God sent his son. He sent his son so that he would live as a man perfectly, without sin. And because he was without sin, he could be the only sting bearer on our behalf. He was the only one who could fulfill God, the Father's righteous requirements, and serve as the one who upon himself would take the sin of the world. And the scriptures also say that as many as received him, he gave the right to be called the children of God. So the sting of death has been taken away. Jesus died for sins once for all, the scripture says, for the righteous and the unrighteous to bring us to God. I love that unrighteous part because so many days I don't feel like I'm very righteous. When I'm stuck in traffic, yeah, I'm not the most righteous guy. When my day doesn't go the way I've planned, I'm maybe not the most righteous guy. When I'm grieving the loss of a loved one, yeah, righteousness seems like it's a little bit of a reach away. That's why I love that passage that tells us that Jesus died once for all, the righteous and the unrighteous. And he invites us to just simply place our faith in him. He's our sting bearer. He can be mighty to save for us. And then the third promise, he simply says this, he will take great delight in you. The psalmist says, he brought me into a spacious place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. And later the psalmist says, the Lord delights in the way of the man whose steps he has made firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall. He upholds him with his hand. And then again, he says, for the Lord takes delight in his people and he crowns the humble with salvation. I had to see in that slideshow the delight of parents and family for Emily. And I want you to know that as much as we saw and experienced that, friends, we have a father in heaven who looks down on us and when he sees us because we're made in his image, because we are of him, he delights in us. So many people have a picture of an angry God with a big stick. That's not the picture I have. Uh, my picture is more of a grandfatherly kind of guy sitting on a chair and saying, come, my grandchild, sit on my knee and let me look at you because looking at you makes me happy. When I see you, I see my own image. I delight in you. And then the fourth promise is that he will quiet you with his love. When I'm embroiled in the pain of grief, many times I'll lay my head on my pillow at night and that will be my simple prayer. Oh God, quiet me with your love and let me sleep because sometimes sleep is fleeting. God quiets us with his love by bringing peace to our souls. It's a great picture of this in the scriptures. Jesus was tired after preaching for a whole day and his disciples and he got in a boat and they were sailing to the other side of the sea and in the middle of the night he was sound asleep in the boat and big wind came up, a storm, in fact, and the disciples were terrified. They thought the boat would be swamped and they would all be lost. And they looked, and there's Jesus, sound asleep in the boat, as if there's nothing going on. There's no storm. And they 
wake him and they say, you know, what are you doing? We're, we're all going to die here. And, and Jesus quietly got up, stood up, and he simply raised his hand and the wind died. And he said, be still, and the sea was still. He was the master over the wind, over the waves. Why shouldn't he be? He created them. But he demonstrated to his disciples in that moment that he was one who could quiet them with his love. And the final promise in this passage from the prophet Zephaniah says, God would rejoice over us with singing. And, and the picture here is simple. As we understand that God is with us, as we understand that he is mighty to save, as we acknowledge his desire to delight in us, and we're encouraged by his presence and even compelled by his spirit to accept his offer of peace. He rejoices over us with singing. He's waiting for us to lean in and just say simply, Lord, I need your help. Help me in these days. The beautiful thing is his embrace is a free gift for us. It's simply by faith. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything else other than receive by faith that he loves you, that he sent his son to die for you. And therein lies such peace and such hope. Friends, the Lord your God is with you. Even in the midst of Emily's passing, and he's mighty to save, he'll take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Amen. I'm going to pray for us now. So pray with me. Oh, Father God, you are the God of all comfort. You help us in our time of need. And today we find ourselves needing your comfort from your word, your presence by your spirit, and your hope from your life in us through the risen Christ. We thank you for this time of remembering Emily and honoring her life today. Father, I pray for this family, and these friends. And I ask, oh God, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, enable them to experience your care and your protection over their lives today and in the days ahead. For those who recognize ourselves as friends of Emily's family, by your spirit, would you help us to know just how best we can serve them in the days ahead? even in the middle of a pandemic lockdown. And for all of us, Lord, as we mourn this loss, as we honor Emily's life, would you, through your grace, draw us nearer to you that we might lean in and warmly accept the embrace that comes from you to us in this day. We do so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, we're almost done. Uh, there will be no graveside service today, so I'd like to just speak a few words of committal uh, on Emily's behalf. May I just again say thank you for joining us. Uh, to those friends who are joining us online and family, we're so glad that you're able to be with us today. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, the Bible says clearly there's no work or knowledge or device or wisdom in the grave to which we go. And knowing this, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So let us here purpose to seek the Lord with all our hearts and respond to the opportunities, grace and salvation extended through him. Scripture says it is God's goodness that leads us to repentance. 
And repentance leads us to his greatest gift, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So may each gift of God's goodness remind us of his love toward us in Jesus. And now as much as the spirit has departed the body, we do commit the body of Emily Krista Rutenbeek to its final resting place in the earth as it was in the beginning. But the spirit, which is the true person, we commit into the care of almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, in whom is the hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, go now. Go in the love of God, our Father. Go in the grace of his son, Jesus, and go in the fellowship of presence of his spirit. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for joining us today.